the webinars part selection guidelines, what data do you need to make the right decision, and presented by EMA Design Automation and Silicon Expert. So now I'd like to introduce Shannon Henry, Technical Marketing Engineer at EMA Design Automation, and Vernon Densler, Senior Product Manager at Silicon Expert. So Vern, take it away. All right, thanks George. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the uh, component selection process. You can go to the next slide there, George. So it's really important that we really make good decisions up front when we're selecting our parts for our bill of materials. The, the further to the left that we can move things when we're making these selections, the better, because we don't wanna have to deal with things like obsolescence or being out of compliance or possibly getting counterfeit parts. And so if we make good decisions up front, if we have good data up front, it makes it a lot easier to reduce the risk going down the road. And as it gets further down the road towards production, it starts getting up very expensive to resolve these types of issues. So, you know, we really think it's very important that we're looking at data early and that that data is quality data so that we can make sure that we're really just driving the best part selection process that we can uh, throughout. So I want to take a look a little bit at the free data. I know the free data is great. It's out there. Um, you can get to it. But typically, the free data doesn't have all of the data that you need. So they may have a limited source of data. They may have, you know, not as timely updated data. So it may be that during, you know, the process while you're looking at the, you know, your part selection, a part could go obsolete. And if the place you're getting that data from isn't refreshing on a regular basis, you wouldn't know about it because, you know, you're looking at two month old data. A lot of the times what they're doing is they're pulling screen scraping and automated stuff, right? They don't have people who are actually going in and looking at data sheets. They don't have people who are talking directly with suppliers. They're just going to a supplier website with a bot that pulls down information, says, well, if the part's in the catalog on the website, then it's probably still there. With the paid services, there's actually electric engineers that you know will sit there and read a data sheet. They'll contact a supplier and get information. They'll a lot of times correct the information that the manufacturers put on that data sheet when they find issues with it or if feed data comes across and it, it doesn't make sense. Um, and of course, there's quality reviews. There's, there's quality teams that are there to make sure that the data is good quality, accurate data. And then normalization. Normalization is a big thing. Making sure that whatever's in that field for that data actually belongs there and actually makes sense. So you don't have something, you know, if it's a tolerance, it doesn't have an A in there instead of a percentage uh, of tolerance. That, that can be very important because if you're using that data and you're trying to do anything automated, if that data is inaccurate data, then, you know, if it's not normalized, then you could be getting things that would throw off your, your scripts that do your, um, your automation and things like that. So here's an example that I found looking for a part. So this particular part, if I were looking at this as somebody picking a component, I'd say, yeah, it's got a little bit of risk, but hey, it's active. Everything looks okay with it. I used it last time. It's probably okay. I have no reason to believe this part wouldn't be okay to use. Again, I used it in my last design and I'm familiar with it and it's still active. You know, if we look at that part we were looking at before and it looked okay, right? Uh, the designer didn't know any different because, you know, he went out to a free website, was probably doing better than most designers do because he at least went to look at the free website. But it turns out that this particular part is actually not recommended for new design. And there is a form, fit, and function replacement. And in this particular case, the only difference is, is that the new version actually has a, a like washer type 
rubber seal in there um, to help seal the connector. So it truly is a form, fit, and function. If you didn't want the rubber seal in, you could pop the seal out. But if you have that number on a drawing, especially if you're in a high rail situation where you know you have to go through and requalify drawings and things like that, that one simple mistake could have ended up causing a lot of problems by the time you got to production. So we want to make sure that these kind of things aren't happening, that the situations where you have a really long lead time are throwing off your production schedules. And that's why you know this stuff is is really important to have access to good, clean, accurate data, but really more so to have that access to that data in the right place at the right time so that it's easily able to be used when you're doing that design work, when you're, you know, when it's needed, right? And so this is where Shannon's gonna show us with Silicon Expert and EMA, and hopefully you guys think that this is as cool as I do. All right, so Shannon, are you ready to do some presenting? I am, thanks, Glenn. Okay. So here I'm in ORCAD, I have my design up, and you can access the Silicon Expert Connect Bomb Risk app directly in ORCAD by logging in with your email and login information. Uh, once logging in, you get a summary of the design with the total number of components in the design, as well as how many components have been matched and unmatched. The overall grade of the design either A, B, or C can be viewed in the top left corner. All the risk information can be accessed through the links on the left. Each category contains a visual graph, a visual graph of the risk, as well as a view of all the components in the design. By clicking on a portion of the graph, you can filter the parts to that specific risk category. The list view of the components in um, <clears throat> the list view of the components includes the part number, manufacturer, description, a color-coded risk, and the available crosses. Additional information is also provided based on the specific risk category you're viewing. So let's go through the risk categories over here. The life cycle reports the risk based on the current product life status provided by the component manufacturer. So you can view the life cycle status, years to end of life, and obsolescence product change notices. Yeah, this is this is really critical. This is probably the most critical part here. And um, you know, if you see, can can you click on the uh, on the graph there uh, at the on the high? So you know, we have two here that are that are high risk. So we have you know a last time buy and something that's obsolete. So we obviously wouldn't want these two parts within a new design because, you know, first of all, one's obsolete, the other one's at last time buy. So unless you're planning on buying everything right now, um, what are you gonna do about it, right? And at the same time, there's plenty of crosses that we can use in, in place of this. So, you know, by having access to this directly within WorkAd, we now can make these good decisions and look like heroes on the design side instead of being blamed for why did you build obsolescence into this new design? Let's go to multi-sourcing. So multi-sourcing reports the risk based on the availability of alternative components, those crosses. <clears throat> yeah, and th this is important too because, you know, if you're trying to be, uh, you know, risk adverse, you're, you want to look for, you know, multi-sourcing really is the same part number, so it's the exact same part number but it's made by several different manufacturers. So it is always gonna be a form, fit, and function replacement for that. And if you can choose a part that has multiple manufacturers making it, obviously that's gonna reduce your risk of having obsolescence hitting you quickly. It also is gonna help you possibly with lead time because you have multiple manufacturers making it, so those multiple manufacturers are going to be you know, stocking up quickly, and there's usually going to be stock somewhere of the part. Compliance reports the risk based on the components adhering to the environmental and government regulations. So in this view, uh, you have the ROHAS and the REACH information available. 
yeah so again if you're working within areas where you have to be compliant um you know with any of the european union stuff california any of that uh you know this helps you with the risk and then you know we have all, access to all the data right within the parts uh you know when you click on a part you'll be able to see all that data download the documents get everything you need to make sure that you're picking parts uh either either if you're in that or if you're in military and you're trying to avoid the lead free stuff to avoid tin whiskers you know it can work both ways it, it can help you to to understand um you know when you're doing that part selection what is that that part you're looking for and the inventory tab reports the risk based on the market availability of components uh, so here you can see the number of distributors available and also the budgetary pricing yeah and this is again you know um inventory price lead time this is important stuff and you know one of the things that you have to look at is if inventory is kind of running low then somebody's buying this stuff up and there's a reason for it so you know you may have to look at putting in some advanced orders or things like that uh, you know it's one of the things that that we've really been looking at and we'll talk a little bit more at the end of this about uh you know some of the COVID stuff but you know just looking at lead time alone doesn't tell you necessarily what demand is looking at inventory risk does tell you that there is some demand or isn't demand and if you all of a sudden see a spike in demand that could be an issue you need to look at or you know even though it's a two-week lead time even though it's not obsolete if somebody's buying it every time it hits the shelf it doesn't do you a whole lot of good and there's also the overall tab and that combines the previous categories to provide a comprehensive analysis for all the components uh, so to view more information on a specific component, click the corresponding part number. Let's do it for a high risk part. You can view the available data sheet, as well as ad additional information on the part. Um, so the overview tab provides identifying and miscellaneous information, as well as all the available crosses. And we'll come back to the crosses a little bit later. The technical tab provides the parametric data, packaging and manufacturing information, as well as design, re design resources and reference designs if they're available. The compliance tab uh, provides environmental, chemical, and conflict minerals information. And all of the all of these things where it's blue it's clickable and if it's a document you can get the documents right there you don't have to go somewhere else to look at them uh, the supply chain tab that provides the inventory and pricing information the risk tab provides the risk analysis for each category and it also provides the counterfeit risk and the confirmed counterfeit reports yeah, and counterfeit's important. It is very important. It's it's really starting to hit us a lot bigger than uh, than people realize. I think so. Um, you know, this one's got a high risk because it's it's a you know a high risk part to begin with, and it's very likely to be counterfeited. And then the history tab provides the history for the part and the associated documents. So you have the data sheets, the PCNs. Okay. So if the component is high risk and needs to be replaced in the design, you can easily view the available crosses. Uh, the crosses are, like we said, the alternative components that are similar to the original. So when you're selecting a cross, you can view the part number, manufacturer, description, some key risk information, there's the cross grade and then the differences. So clicking on a part number, you can view the additional information and the corresponding data sheet again. So for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm gonna go back to our schematic and update that high risk part with the 
cross manufacturer and manufacturer part number. So typically, if this was your design, you would want to fully replace your component. Um, but for time's sake, we'll just update those part information. And going back into the SE Connect bomb risk app. So that high risk part is no longer reported in your design. Uh, you can also export a CD, CSV or PDF of the bomb health grading report. And we'll just pull that up. So this makes it easy for multiple team members to review the risk analysis uh, for your design at any time. It, it includes the overall grade, a visual representation of each risk category, and then additional information on the risk and all the available crosses. Okay, and that completes the demo portion. Great. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, so I think everybody can see that this is makes things a, a whole lot. Um, and one of the things that, that we didn't show here that is uh, will be available shortly within the platform is parametric searching. So you'd be able to do full parametric search and get all the same kind of information. So you don't have to start with a part. You can go looking for parts. Uh, makes things a lot easier. Um, along with uh, approved components list. So if you have an approved components list in Silicon Expert, it's going to be available so that when you're going to pick a part, you know if it's on the approved list or not. Uh, so that's, you know, other good stuff that's coming to make this even better. All right, so let's yeah. move on and have Vern chat a little bit about the COVID-19 situation with the supply chain. Yeah, so um, just a couple brief things on this, you know, we're not gonna go too in depth on it, although we are uh, putting together a, uh, a kind of panel discussion here in the near future uh, that'll be out in the next week or so. Uh, so please look out for that. Look, you know, I just wanted to, to hit a couple key points. So, you know, manufacturing versus distribution issues. So when we first saw this happening, everybody's concern was, well, is my stuff being manufactured in Wuhan or in any of these areas in China that I need to worry about? You know, what's going to happen to the manufacturing? And Honestly, it looks like China had enough stock that they were able to really go through the shutdowns and not really impact their production a whole lot. But that's the manufacturing side. Now the concern really is shift distribution part of it, which is getting it from China to here. So if China has all these chips and they're sitting there on the dock waiting for somebody to pick them up, it's still a supply chain issue. It's a bigger supply chain issue. And so, you know, the, the concern now is becoming, you know, okay, well, the parts are available, but they're not at my distributor. And, you know, maybe they're sitting in the docks in New York because nobody can get them offloaded off the ships. And if they are getting them offloaded, what they're, what they're doing is they're going to prioritize medical equipment over, you know, any of the, the stuff that we might want, you know, it's, they're not going to prioritize TVs or, you know, anything like that. So, you know, there's the issue kind of morphed and, you know, we have to kind of take this as a lesson for the next thing like this, that it's very possible that we're going to see the same kind of things again. That, you know, if it's a worldwide event, you know, what's the ripple effect that we didn't think about in the beginning? The, um, you know, I, I, I kind of, you know, I was thinking about this is like, okay, you know, really cool you know automotive is pretty much shut down the automotive plants now so maybe we don't have to worry about another mlcc issue where you know automotive is buying up all the the parts and you know we can't get anything for the other stuff we're building that's probably true but as soon as they come back they're going to be trying to pump out as much as they can in a short amount of time they're going to be working third shifts they're going to be doing everything they can so chances are they're going to be having a surge of all the stuff they need for the cameras and not smart smart cars, but you know, all the, the stuff that's in the cars that the lane uh, assist and all that stuff. So, you know, be prepared for that. Be prepared that as soon as they start opening these assembly lines back up, they're probably going to be putting in some big orders and stuff that they were buying before may all of a sudden become a shortage again. And then medical equipment. So, you know, 
that's going to be important. Are the parts you're using something that's needed for a ventilator or anything else that, you know, might be needed, you know, for the medical issues that we're going to be having? So, you know, if that's the case, you got to look at how that's going to impact you. Or there are other parts you can use that, that may not necessarily be, you know, medical rated that that will still work. So, you, you know, again, something to think about. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have answers to those right now. We're working on every Thing we can do to, to try and figure that out. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's something really to be think about. And again, in the, you know, the panel that we're going to do, we're going to get some experts in and we're going to talk about this stuff. And, you know, yeah, a lot of it's going to be opinion, but it's going to be at least um, some people that deal with this stuff on a daily basis and hopefully be able to, to help figure out, you know, maybe some of these things we can do to at least look at what's going on and, and hopefully plan for it. We're Silicon Expert, we're all working from home. Um, everybody's set up, we're still doing everything we're doing. We're still getting direct feeds from suppliers. So our, our data is still there, our, our quality is still there, our accuracy is still there. So you, you gotta think about that, is, is, you know, is that, you know, is this a time where you wanna be relying on data that may not be up to date or, you know, do you wanna look at, you know, making sure you got the good data, so. Um, all right, and I think that's really it for this until questions, right? Yes. So, um, so first one, um, how do you determine the life cycle? Um, do you track each component, family, and manufacture? So, a um, couple different ways. Overall, you know, the status of the part comes directly from the manufacturer. Uh, we have direct feeds from a majority of the larger manufacturers. Uh, anybody who we don't have direct feeds from, a lot of times they'll send us a spreadsheet. And if we can't get it any other way, we'll either call them up or we'll, you know, go get the information, you know, from their website or wherever, whatever we have to do to get it. As far as our predictions go, we have algorithms that were designed uh, in conjunction um, with Dr. Peter Sanborn. He's the godfather of DMSMS. And so we look at a lot of different factors and use his algorithms to determine what we think the risk is of that part going obsolete. And, you know, our data plus our, uh, you know, some of our customer data who looks at the same thing, um, we are 98% accurate. We're, we're very proud of how accurate we are and, and they, you know, our customers confirm it. Uh, if we say something's high risk, it goes obsolete within five years, 98% of the time. The uh, the cost, so uh, the cost for this particular plugin is uh, $1,200 for 1,200 parts. It is a single user uh, license, although uh, we do have enterprise licensing that we can work out, uh, you know, just get in touch with us and we'll get a sales rep to talk to you. If you're an existing customer, obviously, you know, we'll be, uh, even more willing to work with you on pricing if you're looking at you know a large number of seats. Uh, so there's an avenue to request the part that's not in the database, um, not through here, um, through our our main tool. Absolutely, uh, we have a way to that you can if you can't find the part you can submit a ticket and uh, we'll do the part research and we'll get it in there for you. Um, we're not doing it through the plugin yet. We may or may not, uh, if we do, it would be at a premium because it does cost you know us labor to go actually do that research. And again, it's we have over 400 component engineers that are out there doing that work. Um, and a lot of times they're you know back and forth with uh, a manufacturer you know many times to get the right accurate information. Um, but it is, like I said, available through our main tool. Is our compliance information current, as current as it can be? Um, we are constantly watching for any changes and always in advance of when the regulations hit, we're making sure that we have as much data as we can to make it as accurate as possible uh, for when those uh, changes hit. Um, so we have we have a team that is specifically working on compliance all the time and, and making sure that data is up to date. 
So how do we get inventory information and how reliable is it and how often is it updated? It depends. Um, some of that we get directly from the distributors. Uh, others we get uh, through other methods. Um, if it's direct from a distributor that allows us to test up to the minute, um, if it's other places, it, it can be up to a week old. It's meant as a reference, not necessarily full, you know, this is what's there right now, but um, it's fairly accurate. Um, are, is Silicon an expert looking at the Rojas six, six part without exemptions? Um, given that number of exemptions will go away. Um, and what are we seeing with Rojas? Yes, as I said on the last one, we are actively working through all of that. We will be ready for it uh, in 2021 when it happens. It's an interesting thing because the Rojas compliance is actually what's caused a lot of obsolescence in the leaded parts, which is a nightmare for military and space applications where you have to worry about tin whiskers. So the what we're seeing is is that our market's going more and more Rojas because they don't want to have to have two product lines that are identical with the exception of, you know, one not having lead. Um, so it's that's the way they're going. It, it's just it's been that way for quite some time, too. Okay, sometimes observe a difference between year to end of life and estimated uh, EOL date. And where does that difference come from? So um, it really comes from whether algorithms are able to calculate it. The estimated end of life date typically comes from the manufacturer, whereas the estimated year to years to end of life comes from our algorithm. So there can be some discrepancies there. But again, at the same time, we're pretty accurate. A lot of times the manufacturers like to say that they're not going to obsolete something and then they end up doing it. Uh, will tool automatically generate second sources based on the overall risk? No, it doesn't do that. Um, today, that's something we can look at doing. Um, would have to figure out exactly. It's tough because, you know, we can give you the crosses, but you have to validate, you know, what what you would want to be the that other source. So something we can look at, though. Okay. Um, some engineering enterprises have legacy PLM systems that are not likely to be refreshed, refreshed in the future. What tools and database options would allow for uh, tighter integration with local PDMs uh, to latch onto the SE part databases? Uh, there's a couple of things we can do. Um, you know, first of all, we have um, an API tool, so you could build a custom API into into that uh, tool. Um, our plugin will work with almost anything. It's pretty easy to implement. So depending on what your tool is, it's something that may be able to do a professional service or something like that to help you get it integrated. Um, it really all depends. Um, we do have integrations with a lot of different things, and we're always looking to integrate with anything viable. So as long as it's something that's, you know, even if it's older, if it's something that's going to continue to be on the market and continue to be used, then we're certainly willing to talk to, to anybody. Um, okay, I've got to please provide more details. Mostly we're using Concept HDL in our designs. I'm not sure what Concept HDL is, so is there anybody from the EMI side that? Uh, yeah. I can take this one. So, so that's one we provide directly. Um, you know, that that's not something that's commercially available today, but it's certainly something we can discuss because, you know, that's part of what EMA can, does is help customers build those kind of connections for their unique environments. So I think we'll take that one offline. Okay, sounds good. Um, this may be a, a multiple of us to answer this one because um, I just learned this recently. Um, how is this different from using CAS-CIP uh, within ORCAD? I can take that one too. Um, so what Shannon was showing is showing that at the design level, so that's reading the, the parts and data that's in your design. We also do have an integration to the Silicon Expert data at the, the database level, so at CIS and CIP, um, and that'll essentially allow you to, to get the similar level of information but tie that to the parts in your database. So it, it really depends on you know how you're set up as an engineering 
group and how you know how and where you want that data to be accessed and maybe both places make sense so it it, it you know the, the, our goal in this was to give you access to the data and whatever the the right way for your organization to do that in, is is you know, we try to make that available to you so i don't know shannon or Vern, if you have anything to add but but that's and the two can the two can be very complementary to each other as well i believe um you know the yeah. SEC is a way to to see the the information in a nice graphical way really quick um, and then the uh, CIS, CIP, you know, is a little more in-depth and allows for um, for more interaction with, you know, the parts list on the back end. Okay. Um, okay, so Silicon Expert supports other design platforms. Um, a quick menu, uh, like an ORCAD, such as Altium pads, in which would... Uh, be the states to handle a library by Silicon Expert and R&D, et cetera. So um, no on Altium um, pads. So we're right now EMA. Um, we're working with Zukin um, Mentor. We really don't. We're working with them. We don't. We're not ready yet. Um, working with Cadence. Um, so there, there's, you know, there are some some tools out there. We're also in Windchill um, for PLM needs. Um, again, we're trying to get everywhere. We're trying to be agnostic, not to, um, you know, upset my uh, EMA people because I love ORCAD. Um, but we we do try to be agnostic when it comes to all this stuff, and we're trying to give the best experience we can, no matter where it's at. Um, but obviously, we want you to use ORCAD if you can, and and I guess that's time to talk a little bit about that the one benefit coming up to you know I mentioned the parametric searching and kind of on the radar on ORCAD that you're going to find uh, only there at least for a while is they're working on making it so that you can do a parametric search find a part and then if there is a ultra librarian model you'll be able to drag and drop that directly onto the schematic um, I think that's going to be a game changer and why I'm really excited about the this integration with ORCAD. Vern, just just could add to as you guys are working on you know, different integrations, different paths. Um, you know, customers can always access through access this through the web interface that that you guys have, and we yep. can certainly work with that. So if you need the data now, there are ways to get that, and there yep. may be ways to to increase that integration as you as you progress. And we're always looking for suggestions, right? So you know, this is kind of a new thing, and you know, if there's things that aren't there and somebody says, well, you know, I'd really be, you know, helpful if this was included in there, certainly let us know and we can look at putting that on our roadmap uh, for the future. Okay, so um, we are one of the users of, of SE. One constant challenge is that mechanical, electric, mechanical hardware uh, parts database is low. Is there a plan to be on par with these commodities as an electronic? Yes, we are working on that. Um, Again, it does take a lot more resources to do that kind of stuff because the data is just not necessarily there, uh, especially on the mechanical, but it is something we're looking at uh, and even material. Um, so we're, we're trying. It, it just, it's, it's getting the same relationships with, with those manufacturers that we have with the electronic manufacturers. It just takes some time. Uh, is there a free trial? Yes, we have several different free trials. Um, so we have a free trial for SE Connect. Um, and we can, if you're interested, we can get you set up with that. And that way you can you can use it just like we showed you here. Uh, and we also do have free trials for our bomb manager and part search tool, which is, you know, our web-based version. Uh, if you're interested in that, we can also get you set up. So yeah, uh, certainly we'll reach back out to you and make sure that you have the contact information you need to um, be able to find out about that. Um, kind of another one along the same lines. Um, they they have a multi-engineering group that uses various tools, um, including uh, ORCAD Capture. Again, that's that's really what we're trying to do is get the integration there into many tools. So it doesn't matter what you're using, you have the same tool within that platform. And we're really working on getting some communication through there. So if you have somebody who's working in ORCAD and you have something that's working in our bomb manager, maybe that's your obsolescence team that works in our bomb manager, 
they'll be able to get information back and forth to each other in their native tools and you know be able to again make those better choices up front uh, this is a uh, question for the EMA guys is uh, silicon expert only available in the 17.4 release or can it be used in 17.2 I can take that one um, I used in 17.2 and 17.4 um, so how many manufacturers do you cover um, is there a criteria uh, we have over 3,000 manufacturers and distributors um, there really is no criteria if anybody will give us data we'll put it in our database um, yeah we have we have a lot of data and we've got all the major ones there and we have a team whose job it is is to deal strictly with supplier relations that's what they do all day long making sure that you know we're talking to the suppliers and the manufacturers making sure we have good agreements everything so um, pretty robust we have over a billion parts in our database okay I've been told the focus of parts data is commercial what about mill spec DLA industry parts okay so I came from Northrop Grumman. Um, I spent the last eight years of my 18 years there doing obsolescence management and spares and repairs. And I was a silicon expert customer for uh, about four and a half years. Um, everything I did, my lifeblood was getting data out of there. So, you know, we have all of the, the mill spec data. Um, we have, you know, all those parts. I, I'm still very involved with with DLA and the parts management working group and all that. So I'm trying to make sure that we do everything, you know, up to standards for, for what, you know, what's being done there at the higher level uh, in DOD. Um, it's, it's critical <laughs> in the DOD world that you have access to this data because, you know, we're trying to keep stuff running for 40, 50, 60 years, stuff that was only supposed to run 20 years. So you've got to know when, something's going obsolete so you can try to make your buys and decide whether you're making your buys at the parts level or at the board level or whatever um, so absolutely and we do have um, some uh, NSN and information we're looking to expand that as well um, but you know if 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 it's a mill spec part we have military data it, it's there okay we use our SE license in conjunction with an API through our arena PLM are these data synced through the this API so our data all the data comes from the same database um, the licensing would be a little bit different uh, but again we can talk to you about that since you already have an API license um, we certainly are willing to work uh, when it comes to having a connect license can a country of origin be a field summary instead of import data we're working uh, on expanding our country of origin uh, information, really trying to get it down to city of origin, obviously based on uh, COVID-19. Um, and we do have a, a new uh, geo risk uh, tool that we're uh, launching to help with some of that. So um, you're, you're gonna see that there's gonna be a, a lot more uh, in the way of um, analytics when it comes to the country of origin, city of origin, all that kind of stuff. Let's see. Is there a way to manually add the part uh, by the user? Um, so that's really, I mean, if you're not looking to put it on your drawing, that's really where the um, parametric search comes in. And we've got that ready on our side. We just have to get it updated in the ORCAD side. So that's something that uh, hopefully we'll have done shortly. I think it is pretty much about it right now but yeah I think you've covered them all uh, pretty much most of them yeah there's a couple that we'll get to you offline we'll have to get some answers um, yeah yeah I really appreciate everybody being involved in this I appreciate the great questions um, and uh, I hope this was valuable um, you know thanks Shannon for the great demo yeah, definitely. Thank you, Vern, for doing all the answering. Uh, the person that popped in um, to answer a couple of the EMA questions was Chris Banton from EMA as well. Um, and he definitely has a lot of information and will be able to pass on uh, questions that he will be able to answer offline as well. But 
Vern, thank you. Shannon, thank you. Thank you to everybody that attended. Um, this was really a great webinar, part selection guidelines. What data do you need to make the right decision? My name is George Corralius. I was your moderator today. And on behalf of Silicon Expert and EMA Design Automation and our presenters, I thank you very much for joining us and have a great rest of your day and stay healthy, please.